Good morning, everyone. So um, I'm uh, Professor Monica Petraite, researcher at InforAct, um, at a chair project hosted by Kaunas University of Technology School of Economics and Business. And we are continuing today with our InforAct interview series with uh, distinguished leaders in discussing digital transformation and effects of digitization and artificial intelligence development uh, in, in the world. So distinguished leaders and, and professors to discuss. So I'm I'm very pleased and honored to, to have today for our series, uh, Professor Max von Sedwich from Copenhagen Business School, Department of International Economics, Government and Business, a professor if I could say it, in innovation and technology management with a global focus. And Max um, uh, is very well known for the founding and maintaining now for 20 years Glorad um, Research Center, Center, which is a global center for R&D and innovation with, um, uh, let's say so, hubs uh, all around the world, uh, including uh, Lithuania as well. And um, I could name um, many of Mark's uh, achievements, but definitely he is the one who leads the innovation thought in academia uh, with contributions to uh, Oxford Hans books on innovation management with being listed as the top most impactful authors in innovation management over different periods of time. But um, Last but not least, being truly global um, by his research uh, scope, interest, and also engagement. So, Max, uh, very welcome. Thank you very um, much, Monica. Very and, flattering uh, introduction. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so coming to the topic, as here at Inforact, our aim is to discuss effects of digital. Uh, transformation uh, and um, industry 4.0 effects, but especially also as um, we look at industry 4.0, we also want to have a glance at industry 5.0, where we believe that, uh, uh, and it's a common belief that uh, a new models of organization of economic and societal activities is being created. And of course, innovation, has been a driver for a past century uh, for economic growth and wealth creation and countries. If we want to understand and benchmark according how successful they are in contemporary competitiveness, uh, we always look at innovation performance. And since you are really a global innovation researcher, maybe I could um, ask you to comment how all these trends and in industri industrial digitalization, industry 4.0, big data, and especially what we see now in the past, uh, I would say six to eight months, the development of artificial intelligent uh, applications, very powerful generative language models, uh, machine learning uh, applications are affecting like general landscape of innovation, where the focus goes at the global, at the global uh, stand. Yes, well, thank you very much, Monica, for inviting me and uh, have the opportunity to share some of my views and some of my thoughts and observations on this topic. Um, I've been around for some 30 years or so studying innovation, especially studying uh, technology intensive or technology based innovation. And uh, when we first looked at the field back in the 1980s and 1990s, we were already super impressed with the role uh, technology had on, on innovation and on R&D management. And it was really difficult to conceive at that time how this could become even more important. But, but obviously it has uh, with the um, with the rise of the internet. I mean, uh, from a technical point of view, it was evident uh, what the capabilities and the impact might be of the internet on uh, the um, sort of the day-to-day -day operations of performing product development, technology, innovation, and so on. Uh, but what it has brought with it is a, a democratization, some would call it, a, a huge dissemination of contribution of uh, individual 
uh, efforts and endeavors uh, uh, to innovation uh, around the world. And I think this, this is just going to continue. Uh, things like open innovation would not have been possible without uh, this kind of dissemination. The fact that uh, we can tap into uh, uh, the, the expertise, the know-how of uh, random people that we have no idea where they're located, who they work for, uh, what they're working on, uh, or what they have been working on. It, it, it literally doesn't matter. The fact that we have these powerful technologies uh, that connects everybody uh, makes that possible. Um, now, with, with artificial intelligence as one of the key uh, technologies within this uh, wider phenomenon of uh, digitalization. Uh, we're, we're just adding uh, another source of um, uh, of of a, con of a contributor. Uh, again, a distributed contributor uh, to this entire equation, which is difficult to uh, foresee uh, precisely. Obviously, uh, how this will change the landscape. What we do know for sure is that it will change the way we do innovation. And it will change the way uh, people who consume innovation, uh, whether as uh, you know, per people who buy products and use products, or whether they sell people who are actually engaged in uh, in delivering services uh, to other people, um, it will have a huge impact. Which way? You know, I hope we'll be longer lo around long enough to find out. All right. Thank you. I think um, this is. Truly, we know something is happening, and uh, especially as we focus on human uh, centricity, and we start thinking how artificial intelligence uh, can become the extension of human creativity. Because talking about innovation, uh, we know from the very beginning of the of the of the theory development that innovation is about uh, human and. Uh, maybe non-human now creativity and imagination and accumulation then of entrepreneurial and financial capital for implementation of those creative ideas. And since I know that you also have an interest in researching um, creativity and innovation teams, how do you see this uh, turn in uh, boosting uh, creativity for radical innovation because increment and, and also maybe affects uh, potential effects on incremental innovation. How this uh, transition uh, would you see happening? Yes. Uh, now, uh, in in full disclosure, actually, my first degree was in computer science and especially in uh, in artificial intelligence. All of that is uh, more than thirty years ago, but uh, the fundamentals, in that sense, haven't changed that much. Uh, already back then, we've been talking about uh, how AI might uh, be able to uh, change. Uh, and expand the the creativity spaces of the human mind it already has at the time. Um, I, I would I would uh, I would ask you I would ask anybody to uh, who, who's interested in engaging in AI uh, or engaging AI uh, for uh, creativity purposes to to think of AI basically as a bit of a a, a, a joker to bring in. Um, AI is not human, but it's also not superhuman. Um, so we should not uh, expect too much from AI. Think of uh, an AI as uh, a uh, an employee with certain strengths and certain strengths that appear to be superhuman, but also a lot of weaknesses. And we need to be aware of these weaknesses. Um, as as academics, as uh, as professors in particular, obviously, we're, we're concerned about students using AI um, in ways that they do not comprehend and unfortunately also don't comprehend where the weaknesses of the AI are. And for that reason, sometimes we, you know, penalize them with uh, uh, poor grades. Uh, but I, in, if we apply AI also in, in industry, in companies, uh, this becomes even uh, even more serious because the results are no longer just purely academic. Um, there, if the results leads to uh, the development of products that are ultimately uh, poorly designed uh, or unethically designed, um, this this is no longer human or humane uh, even. So if you're if you're thinking about expanding creativity uh, through the addition with AI, uh, it, it it is often uh, I believe the, the the real strength of AI is its ability to tap into uh, uh, areas of expertise that are far removed from your own. 
uh, you yourself uh, tend to be uh, more knowledgeable about the specific uh, subject area that you are the expert on. Um, and I, I don't believe that any I would be able to uh, uh, beat you at that uh, still. Um, but uh, what we are weak at as humans is to understand what's going on in the many, many other disciplines uh, where again, other humans are really good at. Uh, but an AI is actually surprisingly good at bringing together um, uh, these different disciplines and stimulating uh, our own perceptions, our own creativity uh, by providing us with data and providing us with uh, 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 perceptions and interpretations of that data that we as, as individual uh, experts, as experts on a particular fairly narrow subject are just not able uh, from a time point of view and perhaps even increasingly also from a complexity point of view not able to draw uh, individually. So it, this AI or the role of AI, uh, I see this mostly at bringing in uh, a form of uh, uh, sideways or lateral inspiration rather than a, uh, a form of uh, going in more in depth or more into a particular subject matter expertise. So that's very interesting. So it seems like AI would um, change the the search processes for innovation and uh, like uh, who's the front end of innovation and how we acquire information and how we get inspired and how many of um, different uh, uh, ideas we can generate uh, building up on a global knowledge and global experiences that, uh, of course, um, AI could reach through World Wide Web and, and other applications. Now, yep. maybe, yeah, so that, that's really exciting and inspiring. So maybe we could now go back a little bit to uh, from this uh, vision to where we are right now. And I know that you are really in a leading team of uh, global, global product uh, innovation management survey. So how how digitization so far affects uh, innovation management at the moment? What do you see from your really fresh and, and interesting data scope uh, that you have? So maybe you can comment both on the data and also what we can learn now, what's happening right now and, and where we should look at next. Yes, so thank you. I, I was invited by the uh, PDMA to be part of the academic team together with uh, Professor Knudsen from the University of Southern Denmark to conceive and develop uh, uh, the fifth global new product development survey. Um, and that was uh, conducted back uh, in 2020, 2021. Um, so in, uh, in AI timeline, this is uh, already a, a long time ago, almost. Um, but, but anyway, the results from more than 650 uh, respondents uh, around the world um, is uh, that uh, the the best uh, companies, and by the best companies, uh, these are companies that perform best in terms of sales, uh, product innovation, uh, prof profitability, and so on, are also the ones that adopt AI the quickest and the most. Um, so there, there seems to be a, at least a strong correlation between investment in AI and adoption of AI and overall success of these firms. Um, what we also have seen from uh, uh, the analysis of uh, the results is that uh, most of the respondents still don't know exactly uh, what to do with AI. Um, and they seem to be applying AI across the board, uh, uh, across the board in terms of uh, uh, different, uh, you know, different phases of the product development process and different phases of innovation. Um, and across uh, different application areas. So uh, uh, whether this is in the product itself, uh, whether this is in the process, uh, the product development process that leads to the product or whether this is within the uh, wider organization uh, that provides the, uh, the, the, the bed for these processes to run in. Um, there seems to be a, a, a lack of understanding uh, at this point where AI can make a strong contribution or maybe the strongest contribution. Um, there is also a lack of understanding among uh, uh, managers worldwide uh, in general um, 
uh, what AI really is. And uh, I'm not going to blame anybody for this because uh, uh, AI uh, is changing, uh, AI is progressing. Um, and uh, as we are, especially with uh, a survey-based instrument, uh, as we are tapping and uh, re requesting these individuals uh, to provide us with uh, uh, answers that uh, refer to a particular understanding of AI, uh, this can be all over the place. And that is also what we have seen. And therefore, uh, I believe the strongest message is that, as I just said before, um, the best firms in terms of profitability and innovation are the ones that engage with AI the soonest and the most um, and expose themselves to the potentials and the potential opportunities that uh, this particular technology can uh, deliver for them. Well, thank you. Just building up on that, uh, since you also do quite a bit of research on geography of innovation and concentration of um, R&D across the globe. So from, from this particular data or some other data, do you see where is the biggest concentration of firms' efforts in applying AI and, and experimenting with artificial intelligence for new product development and for innovation, is there any geographical dependence or or concentration of uh, uh, of competence or at least efforts for now? Uh, unfortunately, not from this uh, survey in particular because uh, of the way the survey has been conducted. Uh, so it's anonymous, so we cannot really trace back the uh, specific location of these firms. All we know is uh, headquarter location um, and much of the uh, R&D is obviously done uh, in R&D centers around the world. So this can be anywhere. Um, but evidence suggests, if I may say this so in academic terms, that quite a bit of this work is done in the United States uh, and in China. Um, and then obviously in, in uh, hot pockets or hot spots uh, around uh, Europe as well. Um, it's always difficult to say, uh, you know, it's the United States or it's China because these are to uh, huge countries, geographically huge countries. Um, so we would have to uh, be a little bit more localized there. Uh, places like Silicon Valley, um, uh, the, you know, Boston, uh, for instance, um, uh, there are, there are uh, uh, individual contributors really that make the difference rather than uh, regions per se. Uh, one, um, maybe perhaps one point, uh, to be made here from uh, the geography of innovation is that uh, uh, as we see uh, a lot of startups getting involved in the AI uh, industry and the AI economy um, and, and many uh, um, computer scientists uh, graduating uh, from, from universities and, and obviously creating uh, startups uh, or ventures around uh, the expertise that they have gained um, it is the uh, it is very much the the economics of uh, startup uh, activity that concentrates uh, certain technological expertise uh, in areas or in clusters that are already strong in a particular technology for the simple reason uh, that uh, when entrepreneurs fail when these startups fail these entrepreneurs would like to be employable again by somebody else so they like to be close to uh, incumbent firms or close to other uh, startups so that they uh, do not see their livelihoods uh, uh, undermined by uh, having started a company uh, in an area where if it's it's really a, a fail, a complete fail if, uh, if it doesn't succeed. If you don't succeed with a startup, um, you're looking for other people who uh, you could deploy uh, or you're looking for other companies that could employ you. And that uh, speaks in favor of uh, driving entrepreneur activity into clusters where a kind of uh, mid to long-term employability uh, is safe. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that gives, again, another glimpse into global, local relationship. And let me zoom in a little bit to the Baltic Sea region where we are, like um, it's the Baltic Sea that um, like unites us uh, from the very old times. And uh, still there are big differences uh, that we see from our um, European manufacturing survey 
on applications of AI solutions in, in firms. And uh, just the comparison between Lithuania and Denmark, where I'm based now, that in Lithuania, it's um, what our survey again shows, it's, uh, and it's been done before ChatGPT uh, again, a couple of years ago completed, uh, only 4.5 uh, percent of companies manufacturing enterprises apply some of AI solutions, while in, in Denmark, we see that uh, 24 percent, that means about one quarter of manufacturing companies apply already some kind of AI solutions. So could you could you comment on that a little bit? Uh, is there any dynamics? Is there any like, is it associated with some kind of um, platform based work? Or is it engagement with users? So how does it look? Because our data doesn't show it as well. But like, the, the distance is very small, but in terms of uh, technology advancement, it's quite high. So what, what are the core reasons and how how you see Denmark moving on fast uh, forward? So I, I would have to make guesses. I hope they are somewhat educated guesses at least. Um, um, but it may also be uh, just uh, a difference in the industry composition um, and Denmark has a strong focus on high-tech industries, knowledge-intensive industries, which means uh, it it really uh, opens itself itself up to the application of uh, of uh, uh, digital technologies much more than uh, industries that are um, perhaps more hardware and more manufacturing oriented. Still, uh, I, I know this is the uh, the, manuf the manufacturing survey basically, uh, which which may actually mean that uh, we may overlook quite a bit of uh, activity uh, and innovation in industries that are not typically captured uh, anymore by manufacturing uh, um, focused surveys, which is done, uh, you know, software uh, based is a service industry after all. Um, we also see in uh, Denmark uh, a, uh, a, a different type of education um, that I think uh, helps individual to assess the potential of AI uh, more readily. Um, and I think this is not so much a difference between Denmark and, and Lithuania, but it's really a, a difference between Denmark and uh, most other countries in the world um, that uh, uh, in Denmark uh, you uh, have opportunities to get educated uh, outside the uh, regular, uh, you know, high school, college, university type of uh, uh, um, uh, training through uh, something called after schools, for instance, uh, or high schools. High school is not in the sense of uh, uh, a, an English term of high school, but it's, it's a Danish term, which uh, allows individuals to take off time from work or time, literally time from school. Uh, and do something which is completely just up to to them to uh, to expand uh, something that they absolutely just care about uh, or would like to know more about. And it could be anything from from creative arts to a particular technology to a, a different language, um, and that makes people uh, in Denmark uh, more open minded um, with respect to uh, uh, different solutions, different technologies, and um, different ways of being creative. Uh, it, it's really difficult to tie a particular type of education um, to uh, uh, success in AI or success in digitalization. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, I, I think the the one way where humans, uh, as opposed to uh, a technology itself or AI itself, still uh, is going to have an upper hand uh, is. Uh, by uh, bringing in this, the humanity, and the humanities is uh, an art or a discipline which is increasingly uh, uh, sidelined. If you're looking at investments in universities or how many places we provide for students to study, uh, humanities and social sciences, in fact, is uh, on the losing end compared to uh, uh, those disciplines that are uh, seemingly more important uh, these days. Seemingly meaning, uh, for instance, more engineering uh, and more technology-based uh, uh, study places. 
Um, and uh, I know I may sound heretic here as somebody who has studied engineering myself, uh, but obviously you, you cannot drive forward innovation by purely uh, pursuing engineering solutions. Uh, you must bring together multiple different disciplines, uh, and that includes uh, people who have absolutely no idea how the solution will be technologically implemented, or even how to frame the problem from a technical point of view. Uh, you need to bring in uh, people from uh, uh, from areas uh, that represent the, the humanities uh, and the social sciences, because ultimately the solutions, uh, the systems are embedded in social uh, systems and they need to deliver for humans. And I think here in this uh, regard, Denmark might be doing better than many other countries. Um, perhaps especially uh, compared to China, if I may say. I know Lithuania is uh, on an interesting relationship with, with China, uh, but China has for a long time focused on the engineering aspects and the technology aspects. Um, and for that reason, uh, has often been uh, uh, characterized as lacking a vision and lacking even a, a certain amount of soul when it comes to delivering, uh, developing and delivering technologies uh, at the forefront. A very kind of insightful uh, turn in our conversation, and I truly appreciate that. And that uh, uh, takes me to the next uh, question, maybe even to to look deeper, because Denmark, I think it's um, a first country competing with Finland that claims uh, to be um, the one who has implemented a fully digital society, and they claim that the, there is a digital society. So maybe you can comment on what is a digital society, but also uh, second part, it's more um, even interesting uh, or applied for us how this digital society um, enables uh, community to participate in innovation development or kind of boost some kind of community-driven innovation or society-driven innovation, maybe frugal innovation, all these types of innovation that is not maybe made uh, in a linear way and started in R&D labs. So maybe some of these kind of comments and insights. Okay. Yes. So uh, um, as far as Denmark is concerned, uh, every citizen, uh, every adult has a, uh, uh, a sort of a citizen email uh, through which uh, much of the administrative uh, uh, communication is taking place, whether this is uh, voting, salaries, pensions, all of that is highly digitalized. Uh, healthcare, you know, um, it goes through uh, it goes through the internet. It goes through a, a digital system, much more so than many many other countries uh, who are on on uh, on the face of it uh, leading the digital revolution. Uh, perhaps like the United States in terms of the application and the social application, in particular of these digital technologies, they seem to be limping behind still. Um, I, I cannot compare it to Finland in this regard because I don't know Finland well enough. Um, but one aspect that strikes me as far as Finland is concerned, that it's obviously a, a, a country which is uh, similar in size in terms of population. I think geographically, surface-wise, it's bigger. Uh, for, that means, for that reason, also, the people are, tend to be spread out more. Um, and digital technologies uh, allow people to uh, uh, find and develop communities online where the spatial distances no longer matter, or the, they matter less, at least. And, and this is one of the big revolutions we have seen uh, coming back to uh, my pet my pet interest in global innovation, uh, which is very much defined by uh, geographical uh, distances, that these uh, spatial distances and the spatial composition of innovation teams uh, is changing, and the, uh, the, the negative impact of, uh, of distance that used to be present for decades in the uh, decision-making of, of uh, strategic managers locating, uh, locating uh, R&D teams or locating uh, business ventures uh, is changing away from uh, purely looking at physical distance as an impediment or as a, as a barrier to physical distance as a facilitator of innovation as well. Uh, if properly 
uh, accommodated uh, and facilitated uh, by some of these digital technologies that we're talking about. Um, and I think Finland may be one of the countries uh, where, they, where they are at the forefront of uh, making use of such digital technologies in order to overcome uh, physical uh, spatial distances by creating uh, uh, digital communities where uh, the location of the individual contributors just no longer matters. Very nice. And I, I think all these countries, we, we all have we are small countries, but we still have uh, concentrations uh, more towards uh, cities and certain locations. I think it's very beneficial to learn from that. So for, let's say, like concluding remarks of our conversation. So then um, uh, my question would be like, if I was an SME, like a small, medium-sized company, eventually uh, with uh, a bit of good competences and skills inside, but still small in size and um, based here in, in this region. So how, how could I start my journey towards uh, digital, uh, I would say not only digital transformation, but also AI um, Im imposed uh, transformation and and the opportunities on one hand and what are the ultimate watch points like a warning points as that as we embark on that journey in order not to uh, run into some kind of disasters like IPR violations or other things that can just kill business so just generally how to start thinking and how to move on Yes, uh, well, I don't think it will be much different uh, for Lithuania as it might be for any other country. Um, but uh, any kind of change must come from the top. Um, so if, if you have senior management, CEOs, uh, founders perhaps as well, who uh, are uh, generally interested in uh, understanding and adopting uh, modern technologies, uh, uh, not just for uh, uh, for 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 the the purpose of uh, improving businesses, but really also for the purpose of improving livelihoods, um, for making employees more powerful, uh, more capable, uh, and um, and allowing them to uh, express themselves uh, through the work in better ways. I, I think this is this is where it needs to start, um, and I really. I, I don't doubt that there are many people in Lithuania uh, who want to do this. Um, second is obviously a, a proper change management approach, uh, which means that uh, you you want to do this in a in a in a in a matter of way that uh, delivers uh, early, and it delivers uh, uh, meaningful contributions uh, to everybody in such a way that. Uh, uh, the these new technologies are being embraced and adopted uh, more quickly. Um, so it's it's it may be a leapfrog uh, for uh, many companies uh, to uh, to adopt digital technologies uh, and AI being just one of them and and ChatGPT by the way just being one of the many many different AI uh, techniques that uh, uh, we know of. Um, but getting uh, to a leapfrog means that you're making many, many small uh, decisions, many small adoptions, many small uh, projects uh, on the way. And many of these individual efforts uh, are super incremental uh, and may not be worth the effort and may not be worth the investment if you're purely looking at it from an economic point of view. Uh, but they're absolutely necessary in order to uh, create uh, a movement within the organization so that everybody's on board of that and nobody feels left behind because I think this is one of the greatest dangers in, in many of these change projects uh, uh, and, and perhaps in particular uh, digitalization uh, change projects um, that employees feel that uh, they are no longer needed, um, that they have not been asked to even participate um, that digital technologies are here to replace them uh, rather than to support them. Um, and uh, 
if if that is truly the case, obviously, I think uh, the these employees are uh, justifiably uh, worried. Um, so a good organization will need to find ways to uh, uh, address these fears and embrace everybody as uh, uh, as 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 contributors to the digitalization. It's a, it's a human change that needs to take place. It's it's not the technology itself uh, that uh, allows um, the a, a suitable application. It's the the organization which is built around humans uh, is what really adopts the technology. Um, and we need to find ways how to make sure that everybody's on board. Um, and if there's only, uh, you know, if there's some people who are not on board, um, they will not just abstain from the change. They will not just abstain from adopting technology. They will often uh, work against it um, in order to protect themselves. Um, and that is one of the greatest dangers of any innovation project, of any of any in adoption of a technology. And most innovations we get adopting of technology rather than inventing technology, right? Um, uh, that there are uh, there's active re resistance, active opposition um, that undermines uh, any business plan that has been built upon uh, uh, rational decision making rather than uh, irrational fears and resistance. Thank you very much, and uh, I think this is very insightful and and helpful and. Um... Uh, we have learned from this uh, short conversation that uh, application of uh, uh, second, I would say, like um, of, of like more sophisticated uh, wave of uh, digital big data uh, enhanced artificial intelligence driven uh, technologies. It's at the very fuzzy front end, and uh, there is lots of room to experiment. For, for small and for large uh, enterprises. And it seems like, uh, uh, again, we go back to very human questions like uh, uh, understanding social systems and constructs and uh, I would say transversal trans cross-disciplinary uh, skills and creative problem solving becomes even more important than ever while given this opportunities provided with this, uh, I would say, new technology wave uh, that um, is being uh, like uh, formed or is unfolding up front to our eyes. And of course, it has a good uh, promise for democracy and inclusion with um, one critical, um, I would say, uh, condition, uh, capability to join this uh, digital economy and uh, and to, to, to benefit from all these opportunities that technology brings. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been very inspiring and um, uh, mind-opening conversation. I really appreciate your presence and your talk. Thank you. Monica, the pleasure has been all mine.